Thank you, Brother Justin. I had him read that verse and, and uh, that chapter, and there is a purpose. Last week, I wonder if anybody caught this, but I had him read a chapter, Genesis 26, and then never said a word about it. And <laughs> maybe nobody noticed. I asked him, and he said, I was kind of wondering that myself. Because I never went back to that passage, to that chapter. I never said anything about it. So let me just briefly say the point of him reading that last time is it was it was uh, Jacob, uh, and he came across wells that the Philistines had filled up, and they were wells that were dug by Abraham in the past. And so the point that I was going to make, and I failed to ever get to that, was simply that you know he went back and he dug up some of those old wells. And the point that I was making, and this is, a, this is something that I've heard preached many times, is that as independent Baptists, that's what we need to do sometimes is dig up some of those old, right? And he found a spring of water in there. And uh, that was the idea. But anyway, last week was kind of an introduction on the little kind of mini series that I'm preaching. And the, uh, the, the title, title of the series, I guess, Revisiting Old IFB Hobby Horses. Okay, this is what they would call the hobby horses. They get up and they like to preach on this and preach on that. And a lot of people said, uh, you know, hey, we don't like independent fundamental Baptists anymore because they preach this and they spend too much time talking about these things. And then I read, and I'm going to reference this article again, but I read this article where these people uh, I talked about, like the uh, recovering uh, fundamentalist and this article where there was an interview that was done to all these people who had left the independent fundamental Baptist churches and uh, we talked about how it's not a denomination, but it's kind of referred to sort of like a denomination in that article. And they left IFB churches uh, for various reasons, and now they're so bad. I read one of the uh, uh, testimonies was that they have to go seek counseling all the time now, and they're on medication, and I don't know, PTSD or something like that, because they used to be an independent Baptist church. <laughs> It was kind of a kind of a bizarre, but anyway, a lot of different things in there. Now, here's the problem, and this is kind of a twofold purpose of this series here, is because number one, uh, there are some things that the independent fundamentals uh, Baptists used to preach that aren't really preached that much anymore, and they're good things that need to be preached, and so we want to revisit some of those things. But the other thing is, be, you know, there's always a little bit of truth in these things, and there are some things that. You know, we want to be careful of, and there are things, maybe people that took a certain teaching or, or th uh, a school of thought too far, and it caused a lot of problems. And so we've touched a little bit about that, but that was mostly introduction. Today, I'm going to get started. One of the things uh, that came up over and over in studying some of these testimonies from people and what the world and, and people uh, from different denominations and all say about independent fundamentalists and uh, one of the things had to do with the authority of men, the way they treat women and stuff like that. And so the, uh, this, I guess the title of this particular sermon would be Male Leadership and Their Expectations Upon Women. Male Leadership and Their Expectations or for Women, I guess you could say. And that's why we read 1 Peter 3 because it talks about women with a uh, having a meek and quiet spirit and that's not very popular to say those kinds of things anymore it used to be preached on it used to be preached on and there was this idea of a man was supposed to be the authority and the woman was supposed to be in subjection to the man and if you say that nowadays people get bent out of shape and uh, they get very upset very offended by that and let me just say this it's nothing new this is why it was preached on so much in the 40s and the 50s because it was something that even back then they were struggling with Okay. Uh, after World War II, there was this really big, maybe because the men were gone for so long and they were dealing with so many different things that women began to kind of have to take charge and take leadership and feminist movement really was on the rise. And so back as early as the, 40, uh, the 40s, uh, here's a book from John R. Rice written in 1941. So that's uh, even a little bit before that. And uh, the title of the book is Bobbed hair, bossy wives, and women preachers. <laughs> this is what he's preaching about in the 40s, you know, because it was on the rise. People were uh, having problems with this. Bobbed hair, right? That'd be like short cut, short hair. You think about Bob, like a bobtail dog or a bobtail, uh, uh, 
what else do they bobtail? De uh, horses, I guess, if you're or riding a sleigh, a reindeer or something. It means they <laughs> they cut off the tail, right? So it's bob. So bobbed hair means that they cut off their hair. And he says bobbed hair, bossy wives, and women preachers. And I have read this, uh, I think, but I don't. I don't actually remember what the details are. But what's funny is one time, brother, uh, uh, the guys were over in Kansas City. I remember brother Justin was looking at some books in my library, and he and he came across that title and said, "Hey, this is funny." And then the next book he picked up was this, "Letters to Karen." I thought that was pretty. <laughs> <laughs> letters to Karen. If you don't know, Karen is a word that they use for ladies who are bossy and they have bobbed hair and they uh, and they're so. I thought that was pretty. That doesn't have anything to do with uh, with that. <laughs> but I just want to show you that that is something that used to be preached on a lot. I guess I can leave that there. And nowadays, they don't preach on it so much. You know why? Because there's a lot of authority in churches that are women. You know. Uh, it starts in a lot of the, the teen ministries and the youth groups and the vacation Bible schools. Women are leading all of it. Uh, a lot of times, the I've even heard of ch uh, Baptist churches that have deacons who are women. I know the Bible talks about deaconesses, but I don't think that's the idea. <laughs> right? And they'll have a, a strong presence of ladies. They'll have the worship leaders be ladies standing up there with their bobbed hair and their pants, no doubt, and they're singing, uh, you know, uh, worship songs in the service or whatever. And so now what are you going to do? You have to, you're a preacher, and you don't want people to leave. You don't want people to be offended. So you get up there, and you don't want to touch on the things that are going to make them mad, and you don't want to make a Karen mad, and so you don't preach on it is what some will do, okay? Well, I want to today talk about how no, this needs to be revisited, you know? Are there some things that men have gone too far on that? Probably. Uh, there probably were some things that would be treated a little different the way we deal with our wives or something. But, uh, but also, there's a lot of things that need to be addressed because it is in the Bible. It is something that uh, the Bible talks about, and uh, we understand uh, that this is true. God's called men to be leaders. He's given the authority over the church to men, right? I mean, the Bible says women are supposed to be silent in the church. So certainly shouldn't be a woman preacher, Preachers aren't supposed to be silent. Uh, it says that, uh, you know, uh, all the things that it says in regards to the, the leadership of the church is towards the men. Okay, how about the household? Well, certainly the Bible says the man is supposed to be the head of the house, and he's supposed to guide and direct the house and rule over them, and it specifically teaches the wives are supposed to be in subjection to the husband. So these are biblical things. We don't run from the Bible. We don't try to teach what the world wants to hear and tickle their ears and, and preach soft. We want to preach what the Bible says. If it offends somebody, uh, we want to be. We don't want to just go around offending people just to offend them. But if it's offended, offensive because the Bible says it, then it's the Bible that they're upset about, not us. Okay. So we don't want to just shy away from that. So let's revisit that. Because, and the main reason I'm starting with this one, because I have preached some messages in the last year or two dealing with uh, the, the, the roles of people in the church and, and uh, age men, young men, age women, young women. And I don't want anybody to think, hey, this is just Brother Rocky's uh, 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 hobby horse. <laughs> it's, a, it's not a hobby horse, but it's something that many times uh, independent Baptists are accused of having this as a hobby horse, as their go-to, the thing that they want to preach about. And, and the reason I picked it for the first message in this series, uh, other than the introduction, is because all of the testimonies that I heard of people who left the IFB, it was all about a pastor thinks he's the authority and, and, and they treat women this way and, and they think that all the men are supposed to be the leaders and the wife's supposed to submit to her husband and it's like, that's what the Bible says. I mean, so you can't get mad at independent Baptists for following the Bible, right? And so uh, this is something that we're going to deal with. So, uh, by the way, this wasn't just a thing in the 40s and 50s and such. That was an independent Baptist thing, although if you trace it back, it's like the history books are trying to blot out any independent Baptist churches from the record. But if you look, if you look back, independent Baptist churches were thriving, or I should say Baptist churches in general. Uh, a lot of people came out of the Southern Baptist churches, but Baptist in ge general was like the leading, some of the leading churches in work back in the 40s, 50s, 60s. And now that to some degree, they're kind of minimizing, although you can still see them all over the, uh, all over the, the, the world, really. 
Uh, but because independent Baptist churches are kind of going away by the wayside, they're becoming community churches or non-denominational churches or whatever, uh, it's like they're just erasing it from the history books. Like none of these churches ever existed. None of these preachers ever existed to where one day I wonder, like if, the, if we're still around 100 years from now, if the, if the world's still around and people are reading the history books, they'll probably think the independent Baptists hardly even existed, you know. Uh, which is a good reminder, by the way, when you're reading history from hundreds of years ago, hey, it's probably skewed. <laughs> it's probably not exactly like things were uh, during that time. So just a reminder. But let me tell you this. We ha- now live in the time of the Internet, and you can look things up, and, uh, and you can find some things. Out. And I'll tell you this about the uh, authority and the male leadership and the expectations of women. Uh, this isn't something that was just independent fundamental Baptist, but do you know this was something that was uh, all over the world, really? And even in the United States, uh, this was just an understood thing about the men being the leader, the heads of their house and the wives uh, being keepers of the home and submissive to their husbands. And, and I, I, this is, I've been waiting all day to share this with you guys, okay? This is... <laughs> This is an article by a Business Insider, and here's the title of the article. 26 sexist ads companies wish we'd forget they ever made. <laughs> okay? These ads are back in the 50s, and it's like, hey, these companies are wishing that they never made these ads because there's records of them, and people know that they're out there, okay? Uh, let me give you just a few. We're not going to go through 26 of them. I got maybe, maybe five or six, okay? Uh, this first one... <clears throat> Has a picture of a lady, you know, like worried about something. And in the background is her husband sitting at the dinner table yawning. And it says, does your husband yawn at the table? Now listen to this. This is what the, no, I'm, I'm not necessarily, like I said, there's some bad things, okay, that happen that we do need to change, all right? But, uh, but this is shocking because it shows you where things were back in these days. And here's actually the first line, the first uh, uh couple sentences of this article, I mean, of this advertisement, okay, this is Heinz uh, condensed cream of tomato, whatever it is, some kind of, uh, uh, I guess, Heinz advertisement, okay, and it says this, most husbands nowadays have stopped beating their wives. (laughs) Well, praise the Lord for that. (laughs) Most husbands now have stopped beating their wives. But what can be more agonizing to a sensitive soul than a man's boredom at meals? And the whole article is about how you don't want your husband to be bored. You know, you got to really get by this uh, uh, Heinz condensed cream of mushroom to make your meals. I don't know. Some people might get mad that I'm laughing at this stuff. Okay, but I think it's funny. (laughs) Which is why they wrote the article anyway, really. Okay, so uh, the second one is a Van Van Heusen tie. Is it, I think they make suits and stuff like that, but there's ties on this. Listen to this. I, if, you can't really see the picture here, but this guy is in bed with his shirt and his tie on. All right, I don't know what that's all about, but he's in bed. His wife is serving him breakfast. Look at that. She's on her knees, <laughs> giving him the. It's like, how was that not of a, not offensive in the 50s even? But that's what she's doing. And here's what the article says. Show her it's a man's world. Brand new man talking power packed patterns that will tell her it's a man's world and make her so happy it is. <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> what in the world? It gets better, man. This advertisement, these were real advertisements that were ran in magazines and stuff like this. This advertisement, this lady is bent over her husband's knee and he's spanking her. And it says, if your husband ever finds out, <laughs> if your husband ever finds out, you're not, let's see, stove testing for fresher coffee, <laughs> right? So here's what it says. If he discovers you're still taking chances on getting flat, stale coffee, woe be unto you. <laughs> wow. Okay. This one. This one, I don't know why this cracked me up so much, okay? It's a beer advertisement, so I, like, I, I, I don't I, I endorse beer advertisements. But here's what it's got. It's got a hanky, she's crying, and her husband's comforting her. In the back, there's dinner on the stove that's on fire. And it smoke, smokes, well, anything. He says, he says, 
don't worry, darling, you didn't burn the beer. <laughs> wow, man, this is a, you can see why the article says these are things you don't want, uh, these, co these companies wish that you didn't know existed. This, uh, this is one with a lady, uh, and she's got a ketchup bottle here, and it says, you mean a woman can open it? <laughs> All right, how about this one? Get out of the kitchen sooner. It's got a lady here with stacks and stacks of dishes. And then in the back room here, she's got her husband sitting down in a recliner playing with the kids. And it says, get out of the kitchen sooner with this Lux uh, soap, I guess. All right, here's another one. These are, <laughs> I'm almost embarrassed to show some of these things. This is a sweater. Here's some guys that are like, uh, I guess mountaineer men, <laughs> mountain men or something. They're climbing the top of the mountain, and he's holding. A, he's talking to his friend here, and he's holding a rope, and his wife is like dangling off of this cliff. I can't you, can't you not. Here's what it says: Indoors, women are useful, even pleasant. On a mountain, they are somewhat of a drag. So don't go having. Uh, don't go hauling them up a cliff just to show off your drum and climbing sweater. <laughs> What in the world, man? This is some weird stuff. Like, I don't endorse these, or I don't, I'm don't. i saying, like, advertisement should get back to this kind of thinking, okay? But what I'm showing you, though, is it was pretty typical in our world not that many years ago for them to say, you know, hey, men are uh, the leaders, it's a man's world, and the women are supposed to submit. And that's a foreign thought today. If you have that kind of an idea and you say anything even close to that, you're going to get banned from YouTube and, you know, kicked out of, a, out of town or something because people don't like that. And so is it a man's world? Now, here's the problem. And I'm going to show you here in a second that this is a philosophy that has existed from the beginning of the time in all cultures. There's an understanding. Men are in subjection. I mean, it's just nature. Nature teaches you. They're stronger. They're, I mean, uh, uh, women are in subjection to the man. Man is stronger. Hey, he's got, you know, he's got more strength. He's got all these, uh, you know, things that God gave him ability to lead, all these kinds of things. And the woman is subjection. This is something that is, is, is just been throughout all cultures. And so even in the United States, whereas obviously not everybody is a Christian, there was this understanding of, of that. And so naturally, just like any sin out there, People with that natural understanding are going to take it too far, and they're going to become sinful. Now, Christ taught Christians how, how Christian men how to treat their wives, and uh, how we're supposed to treat women. And it doesn't at all show that we're supposed to be demeaning to them, or to be rough with them, or to abuse them, or to do anything like that. Okay. So what you're seeing is the world at, in their sinful condition taking advantage of what was common in that day. Okay, and this is how the world works on every subject. But not only that, this was true of every culture. I mean, think about other co Eastern cultures. Think about Muslim cultures and the way that they treat women even today. Okay, and even in their Quran, it, it talks like they're supposed to be treating their women well and all that stuff. And, hey, you can, you can have four wives. You just got to make sure that you treat e each of them equally well and all this kind of stuff. And, and they have all this kind of a, a teaching. But look... In most countries, I used to live in Japan, and I can tell you, most wives in the United States would not want to be a wife in Japan <laughs> or China or something like that. And so these are, this is, and this is something that you would expect. That the Bible says the man is the stronger and the woman is the weaker vessel, which it says. And if it says that, you know, God put it that way for the man to be in charge and the woman to be uh, submissive to the husband, that you would expect, uh, even though, it could go too far and people could go into sin because, uh, you know, in the way that they, they treat that, that fact that you would expect to find it in every culture and guess what it is. Now, guess what? Whenever a culture be begins to start lifting and elevating women up to, to uh, positions of leadership and uh, giving them, uh, you know, the opportunity to make charge and the men just take the back seat and the women go to work and the men stay home with the children. Hey, that's a lot. That happens a lot in our society. You know, we just elected, uh, well, we didn't elect, but uh, uh, President Trump just elected somebody to Supreme Court, right? A lady who has how many kids? 
seven kids or something like that, two were adopted from Haiti or something like that. And I'm thinking, all and all these are like under, I mean, uh, they're all like teenage and younger. I think they're they're real close. Seven kids, right? And she just gets promoted to the Supreme Court, you know. And not only that, she's been a judge for many years, went to law school, law school, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and her husband though is also working as a lawyer or something like that full time thinking everybody's like oh she's such a great mother look she has seven kids look having seven kids doesn't make you a great mother oh yeah but look at the kids they're so well behaved maybe they have a you know somebody who comes to their house a nanny or whatever it takes care of them or something but anytime you got the husband working full-time the, the wife working full-time something's missing the design the, the way God made it is, is there's something not right and I'm not going to endorse that okay here's what the Bible says about that look at Isaiah chapter 3 Isaiah chapter 3 this is why, uh, again, this would make people, not nobody in here probably, this would make some people mad, but this is why I, I wouldn't vote for a woman president or anything like that uh, because I, I don't think that's something that God designed. Oh, what about Deborah? Now, let me tell you about Deborah. First of all, this was a time when every man did that which was right in their own eyes. And Deborah herself, when Barak said, hey, I'll go into war, but you got to come with me because of the fact that she actually had the mind of God and was like a prophetess. Look, there's nothing wrong with women being knowledgeable about the Bible and being able to win souls. Like, right, we have ladies that go preaching the gospel. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with a woman understanding the Bible. There's a lot of ladies in the Bible that the men, men even went to and asked counsel of. There's not, nothing wrong with that, okay? But there's an authority, uh, 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 the, the, the way that the Lord uh, lined it up. And so, uh, and so there's nothing wrong with that. But, but even Deborah uh, said, you know, she, you can hear, read what she says to Barak, and it's almost like, hey, this is going to be an embarrassment to you. You know, in fact, a, God's going to give the victory over to a woman. It wasn't her, but it was J.L., you know. And uh, you can see, like, this was an, an embarrassment. I mean, he was still glad that Israel prevailed and all that kind of stuff. But it's almost like when you read that, what you're noticing is God used Deborah as a judge there and a, and a leader of some sort. I bet you it wasn't still the kind of authority like a man had, but some kind of a leader there simply because there were no men that would do it. And what a shame upon America if women are rising to the top simply because no man will stand up and do it. You know, Women are riding, rising to the top in churches and leading churches and heading churches and saying, well, somebody's got to be the pastor and becoming pastors in churches because no men will stand up and do it. Woe to those people, right? And so here's what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter, uh, what did I say, 3. Isaiah 3, verse 12. And uh, in, this, in this passage here, you know, he's saying, woe unto the wicked. And he's, and he's talking about these different people. But he says, as for my people, now this is a derogatory thing. Says, as for my people, children are their oppressors. Well, look at our society today. I mean, children, I'm not talking about like necessarily young children, but, but, but you know, pretty young people, teenage, up, up even to college age. What do you see going on in our society right now? I mean, I'm, I don't know to what degree, but the looting and the rioting and the standing up and how dare you and, <laughs> and, and the condemning of, uh, of the elder people of the nation and the young people are just like oppressing them. Our nation is oppressed by young people. And here's what it says, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and look, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy past. Now, it's not like a woman shouldn't lead over you because she's wicked, and she doesn't know anything, and she's stupid, and she doesn't. No, that's not true at all. Uh, in fact, I would say for the most part, oftentimes, and look around our society, is definitely true. Women can be superior to men in their intellect, in their understanding of things. That's not necessarily uh, a bad thing. I mean, you, you, women, uh, women uh, early on in their lives, women uh, grow at a much faster rate than, than boys in many ways. To the point to where, you know, you get to 10, 11, 12, they could still kind of be the same size. The women could even, the girls are, are you know, uh, uh, thriving in school and the boys are, are not doing so well. Some of that has to do with the way public schools are run today and all. And, and, uh, and really, um, you know, you see in our society women rising and men, men uh, kind of failing in many ways. But, uh, but at some point, men are stronger 
the Bible calls women the weaker vessel because there are certain limitations that women have, and there's even an uh, uh, emotional weakness that they have. You can't tell me that they don't. I've been married long enough to know. My wife's a pretty strong woman and a very smart woman, but she's emotionally weak sometimes. She's physically weaker than I am, right? And so, uh, and so there are some ways in which I have got to take charge and I've got to be the leader. And nowadays we have a lot of men saying, oh, well, that's not right. And some men are like more feminist than the women are. And they're like, that's not right. We got to let women do this and we got to pay them more. And we got to, and it's just not the way that God designed it. Okay, so, uh, so anyway, look at Esther, Esther 1. Now, If you're familiar with this story, it begins talking about the king there in that time of Babylon. And, and, uh, and he was not a godly man by any means. i got to stop talking so I can find my place here. Okay, look at Esther chapter 1. Here's how it starts. And uh, actually verse 10 on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, which, uh, by the way, doesn't necessarily mean it was alcoholic wine, and uh, the Bible talks about how we can actually be merry, you know, our hearts be made merry with, uh, with other things. But it could have been alcoholic wine, I don't know. But he commanded uh, Mahuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abatha, uh, Zektar, and Carcass. That's a great name and seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look upon. Now at this point, all we know is that the king wanted the guys to see his wife. She's very beautiful, and he wanted the people to see her. Now, when I was young, the only times I ever heard this passage preached on, it was to say, that Vashti was a godly woman, which the Bible doesn't say anything like that. And it says, they pray, in the messages I heard, they praised Vashti because she stood up against the king who was wanting to flaunt her beauty, and she wouldn't do it. Okay, that's the way I heard the preaching growing up. And, uh, and really, there's no reason to believe that necessarily, okay, that, that he was doing it. All it said is that she was pretty, uh, she was beautiful, fair to look upon, and he wanted the, prince, uh, the princess to see her, okay? Verse 12, but the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Then the king said to the wise men which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew the law, uh, that knew law and judgment. And the next unto him was Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, uh, Meres, uh, Marzina and Mamukin, the seven princes of, uh, of uh, Persia and Media, which saw the king's face and which sat uh, the first in the kingdom. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to the law? Because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus uh, by the chamberlains. And Mamukin answered before the king and the pre and princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of, the, of King Ahasuerus. Uh, for this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported. Uh, the king Ahasuerus uh, commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes uh, which have heard of the deeds of the queen. Thus shall there arise too, uh, too much contempt and wrath. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from, from him, and let it be written among the laws of the, Mer of the Persians and the Medes. You've heard of the laws of the Medes of the Persians. Some people say that what they mean is, is like a law that cannot be broken. Okay, and this was the law of that day. If the king said it, that it could not be broken. And we see that all through the book of Daniel and such. Okay, he says uh, that, it not, uh, that it be not or altered, that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, uh, and let the king give her royal estate unto another 
that is better than she. And when the king's uh, decree which he shall make shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great, all the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to uh, great and small. Now, King Ahasuerus wasn't a godly man. And all these princes, these weren't godly men, okay? But they had this understanding, like the whole world historically has, that, hey, once the women start saying, hey, we can stand up to the men and we don't have to do what they, we can cut our hair off and we can be, you know, I am women, hear me roar and, and all this kind of stuff. Once they start doing that, you know, uh-oh, now what are we going to do? All the women start lifting up and they start encouraging each other and all that stuff. And then it seems like uh, there was this understanding that that's what's going to happen. And you look at other societies and that's exactly what happens when the women start, um, uh, you know, making all the rules and all that stuff. Now, Again, you can go too far with that, and you can kind of get to a point where you're unbiblical in your thinking as to the male's authority over the woman. Male, the man can start making the woman do things that uh, that wouldn't be right, and obviously God is her authority before before the man is, right? But there's still a principle that's not only in the Bible, although it is in the Bible. There's a principle that we were born with, an understanding of of this uh, is the way that it's supposed to work. Okay, so. So uh, is it a man's world? My answer is this, no, no. It's a man and a woman's world, and God made it to work that way, but we've got to do right in our own position that God's given us, okay? And so God created man, and then it says he created, it says male and female created he them, all right? When God made mankind, it was the ideal situation. Now, not everybody's going to get married. Uh, Paul talks about that, and it's not wrong if somebody doesn't get married, but he made the most ideal situation. And if you're into science at all, you understand that this is <laughs> the best way that it's going to work, that a husband and a wife come together, right? And that was the way that he designed it. And then they can be fruitful and multiply and all that. But that is the right way. That's the most perfect way that we can exist in this, in this world, okay? Now, somebody's going to have to be the leader, and somebody's going to have to have a, a, a particular job assignment, you know, that this is the way that things work. Uh, and anyone that tries to fight against that only causes problems for themselves, okay? And let me tell you this, women who fight against this principle, they're not happy. They're not happy. You look at all oh, women's li liberation. They're free. They're out from underneath the authority of their husbands and all this kind of stuff. They're free. Look at them. They're miserable. They're miserable. I remember working for this lady, uh, owned an art gallery and all that in, uh, in uh, Oklahoma City. And, you know, you think about you know, art gallery, you know, it's going to be all liberal and all this stuff. And most of the friends that she hung out with were super liberal. She was actually very conservative compared to most of the people that she hung out with. And she told me many times, you know, because she watched my relationship with my wife. In fact, I always said my wife, my wife this, my wife that. And one time she literally said, why do you call her my wife? She said, sometimes since people could interpret that like you're thinking like possession, like she's my wife. And I thought, well, that's kind of weird. You don't say my husband. <laughs> you know, I don't say my house, my church, you know, not in my church. Like I own it, but my, the church that I belong to, you know, my family, my, I mean, this is just the way we talk. I, I said, I don't feel like I own her. And, that, and, and you know, so, but she was reading into that, obviously. She was trying to, trying to say something, but she always watched and she always saw that relationship there. And she always had good things to say about our relationship. And uh, she was there whenever we were raising, uh, I think our second, we already had one child and we were raising a second child. And she was very intrigued by that. And I remember her telling me, she said, I've got a lot of friends who have that attitude. Like, I don't need no man and all this kind of stuff. And she says, the funny thing is I watch them and they need their man. <laughs> they, they, they say they don't need their man. They need their man. Okay. And, and she's like, she says, I think that's, that's an aspect of feminism. She, th she thinks is so foolish. Well, of course, the man needs the wife. Trust me. You know, most of you guys are bachelors. I've seen how you live. You need a wife. But why? <laughs> but wives, if you don't get married, that's okay. But wives need their husband. Women need a man. 
That's the ideal situation. There's exceptions to that, I understand. But that's the way God made it. It's not like it's a man's world. It's a man in a woman's world. But he gave us a way in which we can uh, operate and, and best fulfill this situation, okay? So, uh, so let me just uh, say this, okay? Let me talk just a second about male leadership. And then let me talk about expectations upon women, okay? And again, this is... is um, this is me trying to say these are things that used to be preached about that we need to keep preaching about, but also me saying, look, there were some things historically, you know, read those ads. I'm not, I'm not pushing those ads on people. <laughs> okay, there were some things that were like, eh, that's not really what we need to do. Okay, but we do uh, need to bring these things up. So let's talk about male leadership. What is male leadership about? What is, what qualifies a man to be a leader. Well, men are bigger, men are stronger. Well, being stronger doesn't make somebody a good leader, right? Definitely. Being stronger, being you know, if you're stronger, you can bully people around, you can make them do certain things or you can you can force them, you know, to do things. Uh, I had this plan to talk about this. I think I'm going to turn a whole this into a whole other message on another time because I'm certainly not going to have time today. But Men overpower women, and historically, that has led to rape, molestation, and uh, in the in the poor treatment of women for for many many years. And if you don't believe that, the statistics say. Now I know this is women claiming that this happened, and there are times when that's not true. But the statistics say that one out of every four women have been sexually abused. Okay, I don't have any reason not to believe that, but this is what they say: one out of four women. Now that's just the ones that admit it. You know, you really don't know about those who have never said anything. And most of it takes place whenever they're kids, but then there's up into their teens, and then obviously there's some that even older than that. This happens, and this is a, this is a very serious thing. And so if you remember this, uh, this interview with all these testimonies and all this, that lady's purpose of writing this article and doing this research was to discover the accusations of sexual abuse in fundamental, independent fundamental Baptist churches. And it came out not long after they found sexual abuse in the uh, Catholic churches. And what they found was, hey, it goes on in independent fundamental Baptist churches too. You know why? Because independent fundamental Baptist church, uh, uh, people are sinners just like everybody else. And anywhere there's sinners, you're going to find some people who don't do right. And some people that use their liberty and they go too far and they fall into sin. And some so wicked that the Bible says they should be put to death. And, uh, and that's, that's, uh, that's something I'll talk about another day because I think that message is a good message to preach, mostly about how to deal with people that have been sexually abused and, and all that, or if you know that it happened or something like that. And it's, uh, I think it will be a really good thing to preach on. But what I'm saying is that being stronger doesn't make anybody a good leader. You know, certainly doesn't make somebody godly just to be able to be domineering. And, and it doesn't make somebody a good preacher, by the way, to get up and start belittling people and, and showing their uh, what they think is their authority by like, rah, you know, look at me, I'm a man, and, 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 and these women can serve me breakfast in bed or something like that. <laughs> that doesn't make anybody a good man, okay? Not at all. Okay, but what is masculinity? Because the world, a big buzzword here for a while was toxic masculinity. The buzz phrase, I guess. Gillette came out with that commercial and everything got rolling that way where they said, oh, men don't need to be like this and like this and like this, which they call toxic masculinity. Really what they're saying is men don't need to be men, <laughs> right? And much of it, I mean, obviously there are some things we can do without, but a lot of it was like, hey, men need to be like women is what the ad was saying. And guess what that's called? Effeminate. And the Bible talks about effeminate. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9. There's a lot of places where it addresses this subject, but here's where the word is used. And it's used in a list of, uh, of other sins that are accepted as bad sins, terrible things. If, uh, let me see here. What did I say? Ephesians. I mean, uh, what did I say? 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And it says... Uh, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. But what's effeminate? Well, you really don't have to 
dig real deep to figure out what a feminine. The word pretty much explains this, though. You know, that has the word feminine in it, right? So a man that acts feminine, acts like a woman, that's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. Amen. Equal with fornication, you know, and all these things. Listen, idolatry. It's a sin, just like these other sins. Okay, so what is effeminate? Well, there are some things that are quite natural for men to do that women don't naturally do, and for women to do that men don't naturally do. Now, I will say this. There are vari variations. We, our systems are, are, are so unique, and the way God made it is so amazing, but the way genes work, uh, you know, there are some people that naturally... Maybe a guy that naturally looks a little bit more feminine. It's not his fault, right? That's just the way his genes are. He might have to work a little bit harder to act like a man. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, you know, I'm not saying you have to go out and buy a big truck and be, a, you know. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm all for buying big trucks. I'm just saying, you know, you don't need to compensate because you look feminine. But, but the, uh, uh, there are some men that naturally do that. Or, they, or their voice sounds a certain way. Or they, they you know, there's some natural things that they, it was kind of out of their control. You know, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about somebody who leans toward acting intentionally because they want to, acting like a woman. All right. Now, what is a man? You see, so this is what the society will say today. What, how, who are you to decide what a man is supposed to do, what a woman is? And they want to, like, just do this gender neutraling, blurring of the gender. You know, there is no man, there is no woman. No, no, no. There are things, you know, if a, for the most part, few exceptions, for the most part, you leave a girl to her own devices when she's a little kid. You don't brainwash her into thinking, like, that women are supposed to, you know, do this and do that. You just leave them alone. Naturally, they'll tend to gravitate towards wanting to cook, wanting to clean. I know you can say, well, they, that's because they watched their mom do it or whatever. Uh, grabbing a doll and being like a mother. Doesn't it make sense that a mother would have motherly instincts because they are the only ones capable of producing <laughs> a child? God put that in them. They want to be mothers. They want to be nurturers. They want to be, uh, you know, hey, look, they're more likely to, again, exceptions, cry if they fall down and get a scrape on their knee. Whereas guys would be like, oh, look at that. You see how much blood's coming out of that? That's just natural, right? Guys are going to get dirty. They're going to go out. They're going to uh, get, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, work hard. They're going to fight, right? That's the way God made us. They're going to be, because God made us to be, because we're strong, we're supposed to be protectors, right? We're supposed to be enforcers of good, enforcers. We're supposed to uh, be able to, to lead and be strong and be able to fight and all that kind of stuff. That's what God made us to do. And so a man that's like, yeah, I just don't like that. You know, I just think I want to be more like the woman. Just stay at home and do this. And, uh, and, and, uh, and that would be uh, being effeminate. You know, we won't turn to these places, but in 1 Corinthians 16, uh, the, Paul says this. He says, quit ye like men. Quit is kind of an archaic word that just means basically behave this way. Behave. Behave like a man. Be a man is what he's saying. Be a man. And you could go back, and this wasn't just unique to Israel. You can go back into Samuel, and uh, you can see where the Philistines said the same thing. Quit you like a man. They're saying, be a man. And they said, go to, go to war. Like, stand up to these guys and all this kind of stuff. Be a man. It's not wrong to say that. Even Christians today, because I've used that phrase before and said, hey, well, the Bible says this to men, quit you like men and do this. And everybody got offended and said, no, 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 that's not what it means. It's exactly what it means. <laughs> Be a man. And, uh, and, and so people just don't like it. They don't want to say that, okay, but men are supposed to be hard workers, rough, tough. They're supposed to protect. They're supposed to be willing to fight and all that kind of stuff. That's what God made men to do, okay? Uh, Again, like all sins, men can mess up. Men can use that authority. Uh, just watching something, actually, Paul Wittenberger did a, uh, an interview with this lady. I'm not sure who the lady is, but uh, it, it kind of uh, uh, she dealt with mental health, and she had researched a lot about suicide, particularly in young males. And she's talking about the way our society is today and why men don't feel like they're achieving what they were designed to achieve. And it was really some good stuff. If you ever get a chance to watch that, I thought it was really good. And, uh, and uh, she was talking about how men, when they get angry, tend to be more like lash out and hit something or whatever, as opposed to like women would just kind of like ball up and, and want to be secluded and cry or whatever. And I thought about that and I thought, well, see, that's the problem. Some men, because their anger, you know, uh, 
facilitates that way where they're just wanting to hit stuff, they want to get mad or whatever, sometimes a man will take that out on a woman. And that would be obviously a, a, a bad thing to do. It would be a sin to do that. God wants you to be able to control your anger, right? It's actually manly to, be, to know how to control your anger and to deal with those kind of things properly, okay? And, uh, and to not sin whenever you get angry, okay? But also, uh, the Bible says in Colossians 3.19, let's go ahead and look at that. <clears throat> I mean, really, if you take the natural state of, of our world and how women have been treated in almost every society, really, Christianity is what have give, has given women the most hope. You know, and really, even the liberal, uh, the the feminism movement and all that could really be traced back to liberties that were given to women, because that's what Jesus said, and that's what the Bible taught about how to treat a woman and to love them and respect them and treat them as the weaker vessel, and all that. And it went too far. You know, you can go too far either way. Okay, but because of that, it kind of led to this because you would not in a in the Muslim country, at least back then, I don't know about today, but at least back then, in a Muslim country, you would not have, you know, given women those types of liberties, and they wouldn't have stood up in such a way, but in, in Christianity, uh, hey, we were taught to uh, to treat the woman a certain way and be loving towards them, but Colossians chapter 3, man, I did it again, I keep talking, okay, Colossians chapter 3, verse uh, 19, It says, husbands, now right before this verse 18, wives submit yourselves to your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. But 19 says, husbands, love your wives. And then it says, and be not bitter against them. Husband comes home from work. He's had a bad day. You know, it's natural. He wants to come home and he's got all this build up stress and all that. He might take it out on his wife or his kids, right? It happens. It's not right, but it might happen. And he's saying, don't be bitter about your wife. Don't just start holding her, you know, bringing up old things. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm reading into this a little bit, but I'm saying, don't, don't be bitter against them. Don't just, you know, you need to love them and cherish them and take care of them. Okay. Uh, obviously, abuse, rape, anything like that is, is taking that authority way too far. So when you see that in an independent Baptist church and you see somebody was abusive to a woman or sexually abused them or whatever, do you think any, any independent Baptist worth his salt is actually going to say, hey, there's nothing wrong with that? Of course not. Now, unfortunately, there's some stupid ideas out there, and some people have tried to say, oh, well, we need to be loving towards them and forgiving towards them, and we need to... Let me tell you that I'm getting, I'm getting into the part that I said I wasn't going to preach, and we'll save it for another day. But let me tell you something about that. Nobody has the right to forgive somebody for something they did to somebody else. You can forgive somebody for a sin they do against you, but you can't forgive somebody for somebody else. Does that make sense? And so we're, call, we're told to make right judgments and all this kind of stuff, but we're never say, hey, I know you just abused my child, but you know what? I forgive you. I literally talked to a guy uh, through Facebook, but a guy that I knew, we had this conversation, and I don't remember how it came up, but he took the liberty to say, you know, my child was molested such and such time. And I'm already thinking, dude, you've told me too much. I don't even know. <laughs> you know, my child was molested. And, uh, and he's telling me that his kids, his kid, that's his kid's information. If his kid wants to share that, that's his information to share that. But he needs to know he's protected and his, his parents aren't going to go around just blabbing all of his information out there. And he says, he said, my child was molested. And he said, and I forgave that kid. And to this day, I'm mentoring him and I'm taking care of him and all that. And I'm like, so this child, the, your child was abused or molested by this kid or whatever, it, however it went down, and you have him around him all the time? I mean, that, what is that kid going to think about his dad, you know, who just like, you know, hey, it's okay. The Bible says forgive. Whoa, dad. <laughs> you know, what are you doing to me, right? And so, so we get, you, it's a, a situation that has to be so careful. But look, anytime you go to a Baptist church and you find there, there's this pastor who was found out because this is going on. This is going on. You've heard of cases uh, just in the last year uh, that were tried in court, and, uh, and the guy was found guilty, even confessed that he had done it. And then you got other pastors going to vouch for him and saying, hey, you're welcome to come into our church. You know, we forgive you of that, whatever. That's not your, your right to do. 
You can't just forgive him for what he did to somebody else. He needs to be held accountable for that. And you need to, you know, protect that person who was innocent. And uh, that's another message for another day. But, uh, but anyway, obviously there are abusive men out there. That's not the kind of leadership we're talking about. That's not the kind of leadership the Bible says men are supposed to have. Okay, but it is uh, uh, certainly something that does happen. How about, the, I don't have a whole lot of time, but how about the expectations for women? He read in, uh, Brother Justin read in 1 Peter 3, talks about uh, a lot about the woman being in subjection, being keepers at home, and all that. I haven't, I haven't read any of these testimonies yet. Let me go to a couple of these testimonies. These are the people that were disgruntled. The article, the title of the article says, It Ruined Me, Former Independent Fundamental Baptist Describe Life in the Church. Okay, uh, let me read some of this here. Verse number seven. All right. And it says, uh, all right, at church. And this is the author here saying this, but it says, life in it, this is based on what she heard from all these other testimonies. Life in an independent fundamental Baptist church can quickly become insular. Members are held to standards. Oh God, Lord forbid. Members are held to standards both inside and outside the church. Modest dress for women and a ban on, a ban on movies and secular music in the stricter churches. The pastor becomes the ultimate authority, followed by the man of the house. Members are taught to look at the world with suspicion. And uh, this is one of the things he says. Uh, let me look at here. Uh, verse this is what this lady gathered by listening to all these other uh, testimonies of people who had left the independent Baptist churches. Verse 8 says this. Listen to this story here. The way you respond to this story will it probably say something about your upbringing. If you went to public school, if you were taught a certain way or whatever, <laughs> it might skew the way that you listen to this. When my wife and I read this, we were like, this lady sounds like a pretty good lady to me. <laughs> okay, look at this. My late mother, not long after we had started going to church, my stepfather had asked her to spend no more than $50 at the grocery store. Oh, how dare him. All right, okay, she didn't say that. Unfortunately, the bill totaled $52. Rather than put something back and get the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, rather than put something back to get the bill under $50, she gave the cashier a weak smile and explained apologetically, I'm sorry, but... I'm going to have to call my husband on this. You see, we're a Christian family, and I believe in submitting to my husband. Now, by the way, this is the kid's recollection and his testimony. We don't know how the story really played out, but this is what the kids are feeling like at that time. So off she went to the other end of the store to use the phone. They didn't have cell phones back then. And call my stepfather at work while my brother and I waited at the counter. I could feel my face turning red, and my brother didn't really understand that uh, what was going on either. Our mother came back with a satisfied smile and informed the cashier, I'm so sorry for holding up the line, but my husband said it was fine. I just had to ask him first because we're a Christian family. And this is like said in a mocking kind of way, like, can you believe these independent fundamentals? Now I'll tell you this, my wife has called me many times and said, can I spend X amount of money? Can I buy this? I think that makes her a godly woman. I did never, by the way, force her to do that. She's just saying, hey, he's the one that's in charge. He's making the decisions. I need to make sure it's okay. This is in the budget and I can do this. But you know, the world will say, what a wicked man making his wife have to do that. Well, well here's the thing. Or they'll say this, see if she had her own job and she made her own money, <laughs> she could go out and spend and do whatever she wanted. Look, man, I wouldn't, I, my wife has, has been a huge part of raising my three children, you know, She's homeschooled them, provided for them, taught them to do things, you know, and she has never, since, since we've been married, she's never worked an outside job. Now she did teach some classes at, at Heartland, but that was, I was at school there at the time anyway, and the kids were with her uh, at, the, at the, anyway. So, but anyway, for the most part, never had an outside job, anything like that. And, there, and we got a lot of people asking about that. What in the world? I mean, like you're struggling. There were times we didn't have a whole lot of money and you're struggling. Why don't she get a job? I mean, she can go out and teach. 
lessons, which like, again, she was able to do some of that. That's not wrong for a woman to make a woman to make a little extra money, but uh, but she didn't go out and get a career. She didn't have to go to university or college and get some degree so that she can become this or become that. I'm watching all these ladies do that, and I'm thinking, oh man, you got like five kids at home, and all of a sudden you decided to start a career. I don't understand. This is like the most instrumental point in your life to be home and invest in the kids and teach them, train them. And people are like, oh, how can you put that on the woman? God put that on the woman. God said that's their job. Now, I can't be just a deadbeat dad and say, hey, you got to do all the work, and I'm just going to sit around and, oh, by the way, we don't have any money. Aren't you going to go out and work too and then come back and take care of the kids? And there are men like that, by the way. Now, that's not, that's just because there are bad men out there, <laughs> you know, doesn't mean that a submissive wife is the best, uh, best role, you know, that stays home, takes care of the kids, submits to her husband. God forbid, ask her a husband if she can spend X amount of money. Like, that's not a bad thing, okay? And so this was, uh, uh, we read that and thought, sounds like a good woman to me. I mean, the husband didn't have to, and I don't know, the husband probably like, of course you can spend that $2. What are you calling me for? We don't know what, what happened, you know? I would laugh at my wife if she called me and said, I know you said 50, but is 52 okay? I got to hurry up because they're holding up the line for me right now. <laughs> you know, I would laugh and say, what are you talking about? Of course you can spend $2 more. Okay, but if her husband, let's say her husband was like, not one penny more. And she submitted to that. Nobody did anything wrong. <laughs> it's okay. Husband was in charge. This is the way he wanted the family to work. The wife submitted to the husband. Everything was great. The only thing I see wrong in the picture is the bratty kids that said, I can't believe that. I'm leaving that independent fundamental Baptist church. <laughs> My mom had to submit to her husband, stepdad, whatever he is. Okay, weird. Uh, here's another thing, okay? This is the last one. And again, this is what was going to lead into the, the part about the, uh, uh, the sexual abuse and all that, which we're not going to touch on right now. But here's another one. <clears throat> there was a prevailing belief that it was always the girl's fault even as a child, because if a girl was being modest, this is particularly talking about in the case of abuse or something like that, because, because if a girl was being modest and obeying God, nothing bad would happen. And boys and men were simply unable to control themselves, so it was up to the girls and the women. Now, this is something I've heard for many, many years, okay? Because what happens is women want to be able to dress the way they want to dress. You want to wear the yoga pants? You want to wear the mini skirts. You want to wear the, what they call booty shorts. You want to wear all this kind of stuff. You know, no man should be able to tell you that you can't wear that. Well, I'll tell you what, if, I'm, if it's my daughter, I can, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> That's what I want to know. Where are the men that let their daughters walk out of the house that way, right? But, uh, but even if they do. So here's the principle. The principle is, if that causes some guy to lust, it's his fault. He's got a wicked heart, and he shouldn't have done that. To which I would say, amen. He should look the other way. He should say, oh, I don't want to look at that. I don't want to hang around that girl because I'm going to be tempted to look and to lust after her or whatever. If he can, is in control of himself, he'll have that kind of attitude and he'll stay away from that. But in the rare chance that this human being is going to get into the flesh and actually continue to look, which most of the time ladies uh, will dress a certain way, they, when they put that on, they did want to attract attention. Let's be honest. Okay. You say, no, I didn't. Okay. Here's what they mean. I didn't want to attract attention from those guys. I only wanted to attract attention from that guy. <laughs> right? Well, I'm sorry. That guy wasn't attracted, but all these other guys are. And that's your fault. <gasps> the independent Baptist preacher is saying that it's the woman's fault for what she wore. Here's what I'm saying. Do the best that you can to stay faultless. You don't wear something that could cause some guy to lust after you and to be tempted to, to try to coerce you. And to do. Look, there's some wicked guys out there. I've told my, wife, my, my daughter since the time that she could understand this, you know, men are jerks. <laughs> men are wicked. Men are perverts. Be cautious of them, right? Because as a dad, I don't want her to just, uh, just let up her guard. And, uh, and, and by the way, no, not all men are, are jerks and all that kind of stuff. But what I'm saying is it's within the human nat our human nature and our flesh, right, to do such a thing. It's in a woman's nature 
to want to seduce a man. And I don't mean like all women are just wicked if they happen to wear a skirt that's a little bit too short. But what I'm saying, it is in their nature to attract attention of a guy. That's the way it works. A woman attracts the attention of the guy. The guy is interested. They get together. They fall in love. They get married. That's the way it's supposed to work, okay? But the problem is if a woman is walking around trying to attract the attention of everybody, bad things are going to happen. She's going to end up in a lot of relationships, so she's going to end up attracting the, guy, the, the wrong guy who's going to force her to do something. And that guy, if he, if he rapes her because of what she's wearing, guess what? He should be put to death by Bible, by Bible terms, okay? So I'm not giving an excuse for a guy that would do that. You know, any of these preachers that, uh, that she's talking about who have molested teenage girls that were in their church, look, you don't point that blame on that girl. He did. You know, he's guilty, and he needs to be held accountable for that. But at the same time, it needs to be preached, and it needs to be taught that, women, you have got to keep yourself covered. You've got to keep yourself behaving in a certain way. Now, look, some guys are attracted to a submissive, uh, covered, modest woman. That's I prefer that over a loose woman that just has all kinds of like uh, showing flesh and all that kind of stuff. That might be appealing to the flesh, but I'm never attracted to that kind of woman. Okay, so it could be that, you know, the woman's doing the best that she can and she's still mistreated. That's not her fault, but she still needs to try her best to keep herself pure, to keep herself from, uh, from tempting her brethren in Christ, you know. I mean, you go to a church, you go to a funeral, went to a funeral yesterday to preach. You go to a funeral, you go to a wedding, you go to any family get together or whatever, and it's like, what, what is going on? And by the way, uh, I've, I've been mostly in independent fundamental Baptist churches and good ones that had good standards and all that most of my life. And sometimes people even walk into those churches uh, with a skirt up to here, you know, or something. And, and, and it's like, what, what in the world? You're at church. Why would you want to dress that way at church, right? But some people just have no understanding. They've not been taught. They've not been taught. And they don't have fathers in their life that are going to say, well, what are you doing? You're not leaving the house like that, you know? And it's a shame. It's a shame. But look... There are expectations for women. There are expectations of men. They need to be leaders. They need not to be effeminate. They need to be rough, tough. They need to quit you like men. All right? But the women also have to be of a meek and quiet spirit. They need to be subject, in subjection to their husband. And they need to, uh, uh, to uh, be, do the best they can to be modest and not attract the wrong kind of attention. Look, both sides have responsibilities. All of us are responsible individually for our relationship to God and by the way we live our lives. It's not like a just man. That only, the, the, the man's always right. He, he can do whatever he wants, but the women, you know, they got to be, uh, you know, follow these commands or whatever. No, everybody has commands to follow. And when a preacher gets up, he needs to preach to older men, younger men, older women, younger women, you know. Less so on the younger women. You know why? Because I'm supposed to preach to the older women that they train the younger women, right? <laughs> that takes my responsibility off of teaching the younger women. Because I don't need to be coming up to some woman and saying, hey, I was noticing your legs, and I think your skirt's a little too high right there. That, that's inappropriate. <laughs> but my wife could go to her and do that, right? And so I don't really have to preach to the younger women. But the Bible said preach to the older men, preach to the younger men, and preach to the older women. And, uh, and, and then the, the, what you preach to the older women is that they need to teach the younger women. It's not happening in our society right now, but it's a great, uh, great problem. And, uh, and obviously feminism and all that is, is running rampant and kind of causing a lot of problems in our society. So anyway, I hope that under, uh, everybody understood that and made sense. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for uh, your word, of course, and Thank you for the way that you've made us um, and, and in your wisdom and in your uh, prerogative, you have chose to make some male, some female, and, uh, and I pray that you'll help us to honor you and to love you enough to recognize the role uh, to which you've called us and uh, to, pray, to play our role in the best of our, uh, to the best of our ability, of course, we all fall short. Of course, we all get in the flesh, and we might be, and we might sin in our roles. But I pray that you help us grow, just like in every other area of life and in conduct. Help us grow in uh, knowledge and in uh, wisdom of your word and how it tells us to live. 
help men to be strong leaders, to be the men that you've called them to be, but also loving and kind and gentle to their wives and, and the women and, and, uh, and the wives, Lord, that they would learn to be in subjection to their husbands and, and, uh, and honor you in doing so, as the Bible says. I pray now that you'll bless in Jesus' name. Amen.